Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome all of you for this uh, third webinar of EEE series. As you all are aware, that we can aim to build a strongest force of governance professional, which ICSI is known for, and to add their uh, add to their pool of knowledge. The most recent development and uh, clarity on concepts. Uh, ICSI has launched the master knowledge uh, webinar series. This is EEE, which means enable, evaluate, and excel. This EE was uh, launched at the 24th National Con uh, Conference of Practicing Company Secretaries held on uh, 16th and 17th of June 2023 this year at WISAC. Uh, we have already conducted two such uh, webinars under EEE uh, series. One was on the finer nuances of uh, Foreign Exchange Management Act on 8th of uh, July 2023. And the second, was one, uh, second one was on uh, CSR stepping beyond rule books on 12th of July. So all these uh, sessions we are holding on uh, every Wednesday and both the web webinars, earlier webinars were a huge success. Moving forward, uh, we bring to you this third uh, uh, webinar of the series on the topic and insight into related party transactions. Friends, uh, related party transactions or uh, uh, shortly known as RPTs, have held a significant position in the Companies Act and even more in the corporate operations and functionings of the corporates. One of the uh, key reasons for laying such great emphasis on this topic is the fact that uh, RPTs have a direct impact and connection with the governance scenarios prevailing in uh, corporates. And oversight of these transactions will definitely help all of us for their timely reporting diligent uh, compliances and uh, encashing uh, the key, uh, which is the key to the transparency and account accountability for we as a governance professionals. In such scenario, uh, in my personal opinion, it becomes pertinent to have an insightful deliberations on the various aspects of uh, related party transactions. It give, give, gives me uh, immense pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome CS Sudhakar sir, Yes, Sudhakar sir, to uh, lead the way. Uh, actually, uh, Sudhakar sir is a very well known and uh, very eminent faculty who is a fellow member of ICSI and ICS ICAI also, and a qualified uh, secretary of the Institute of Chartered Secretaries of Administrators, uh, United Kingdom. He, earlier, he has worked with Reliance Industries Limited as a vice president for uh, 17 glorious years and also uh, served Berger Pence India Limited for about 15 years as a senior uh, general manager, finance and uh, accounts. Currently, he is uh, the chairman of the expert group on ICSI's uh, BRS awards. Uh, he has uh, been the vice chairman of expert committee on secretarial standards of ICSI for the years 21, 22, two years. The regu he is a regular speaker, guest speaker at various seminars, national workshop, conferences. Given his expertise and acumen in this uh, field, including all the CV, LODR, and companies uh, at uh, all the compliances, uh, he is the perfect person to guide us and sail us through all the complicated, very important, the deeper uh, nuances on the RPTs as uh, various topics would be covered today during the deliberations in this uh, webinar. Sir, uh, I uh, very warmly uh, uh, welcome you once again and request you to please take up uh, the session and enlighten us, uh, enlighten us with your thoughts, sir. Over <clears throat> yeah, uh, thanks very much, Bhavan, for such warm introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, my sincere thanks and gratitude to Institute of Company Secretaries for having me here to deliberate on a very important topic of related party transactions. Right from 2014, I lost count on how many times I have dealt with this particular topic in person as well as in virtual webinars also. And I used to say always, you know, this is a kind of naive Naveli Dulhan. Related party transactions is like a naive Naveli Dulhan. And always it has its own tantrums like the new bride. Pardon my saying that, but on the lighter side, I can say that very much. It has it, it, uh, its own intricacies, it has its own nuances. And I also take this opportunity to congratulate the Institute for 
organizing this master knowledge series because which is very very essential especially in the passing times where the regulators have become very active and smallest of the smallest non compliance is being dealt with very severely earlier we used to say that uh, the, especially the company secretaries who are handling private limited companies or closely held com public companies they were not having the kind of rigor what they are having as of now earlier so uh, when I mean, we used to say that and sometimes the company secretaries used to feel that uh, they are deprived of working for listed companies or bigger companies whereas now that kind of uh, uh, what's called as the you know, dissatisfaction is not required because even a private limited company is also more or less being measured on the same scale as if it is a uh, i mean in okay as a company under the companies act and without any kind of discrimination as such at the same point of time i'm also said that the regulations are also becoming very very complex day by day instead of the complexity by over a period of time normally the complexities have to come down but the kind of amendments what are taking place they are increasing the complexities what they were earlier anyway that uh, these are all the professional challenges or professional hazards what we have and we have to deal with that and sometimes i always feel that uh, these are the challenging times and the we have an opportunity to prove our metal to the stakeholders and at the same point of time initiative is organizing these kind of uh, master knowledge series and uh, excellent able and evaluate i am sure that you know, okay, the way we got benefited in the last uh, about a couple of years before i think 2 3 years before this was organized and i was privileged to be a part of that i am sure that uh, participants will get benefited with this also with this uh, brief uh, let me now go to the topic let me share my screen with you and uh, i am sure you are able to see my screen yes sir yes sir thank you, thank you very much rpt and ramayan you might be wondering that what connection we have between these two to start with let me say that in fact we all know that ramayan is one of the greatest uh, the epic what we have and ramayan can be explain and okay the pravachan can be given on ramayan in one hour also and in one year also it all depends how much deep dive you want to take into that same is the case with rpt rpt is also like that that you can explain it in about 5 minutes also and you can explain it in 5 hours also and you can explain it in 5 days also ramayan that as many times as you listen to that and i have been told that almost 700 different ramayans are available because the authors have interpreted ramayan in their own way and they got their interpretations published so every ramayan you can appreciate that how lord ram conducted his affairs in the ramayan it is there so we have lot of learnings in all these kind of interpretations of different ramayans which are available at the same kind of time this rpt is also like that lot of scope is there for interpretation and you can have n number as i was mentioning to you that uh, right from 2014 to 2013 almost it is 9 years i lost count in how many times i have dealt with this particular topic in various conferences seminars and conventions like that let me also say that uh, last year we have revised the guidance note on related party transaction and while we were revising that the ssb members we had while discussing we faced certain uh, the fundamentals were come to the uh, the, the discussions again and we were wondering that after almost 8 years of implementation of section 188 or section 177 and still we are facing certain issues the interpretational issues the basic things which they were not amended at all but they were there in the original shape only that is what the beauty of related party transactions a topic which is very close to my heart and a topic which is very complex 
And what I will try to do is that I am not going into a very great uh, legal jargon and all those things because I am aware, aware of this fact that a uh, lot of youngsters which always looks for these kind of webinars. So my endeavor is always to explain the, uh, the topic in as simple a language as possible because the company secretaries of the listed companies anyway, they are subject by the experience and seniority. They already must be understood the nuances of this. But sometimes you know, we may have to focus more upon the, the budding company secretaries as well as the people who have lesser of a, a years of experience. You know. My endeavor is always to be a kind of a reference material and the Institute has, of late has also taken this that uh, they have combined into one library kind of thing for reference material is available. This is what I have been told. So I'm sure that this is going to be a repository kind, you know, and this particular presentation will also be a part of that repository and will be useful for reference purpose. You know. So now let us see what is the related party transactions. You know. As we always say that every transaction with a related party may not be a related party transaction, but every related party transaction is necessarily a transaction with a related party. To understand in a simple language, I can say that that every transaction with a related party may not be a related party transaction means that may not require the compliances under section 188. For the purpose of understanding, I can say that the transactions, related party transactions are necessarily to be a transaction with a related party means that A2F of subsection 188, uh, sorry, section 188 subsection 1, we may call them as a related party transactions which require compliances under section 188. So there is a general presumption that whatever the transactions which are reflected in the financial statements, always these transactions are consummated on an arm's length basis between independent parties. You don't need to say that because it is on the, uh, the financial statements are presented in a fair and transparent manner that itself reveals that all these transactions have taken place or consummated on an arm's length basis without it kind of giving any benefit to any particular party as such. However, this presumption may not be valid where the related party transaction relationships exist. So, so wherever or whenever there is a transaction with a related party, there is a scope to give benefit or undue advantage. And the same is presumed to be given unless until there is a rebuttal, unless until it is established otherwise. Transactions with related parties need not always be disadvantageous to the parties concerned, but only concern is when they are abused. In fact, let me say that when you are in a group of companies that you may be having a lot of subsidiaries, so the transactions between the subsidiaries and the holding company or across the subsidiaries among themselves, these are not at all disadvantages. Rather, according to me, they are more advantageous because they are economical. When you as a group, when you act collectively, obviously your bargaining power will increase manifold. And that is advantageous to all the parties concerned, whether it is subsidiaries or holding company or whoever it is, joint venture companies, associates and everyone. But where there is a related party relationship exists, since there is a scope for abusing that particular relationship, that is to be established that such abuse has not taken place. The concern arises when there are the siphoning of funds and diversion of resources of the company. If you see that overall, if at all, any kind of that nonsense takes place, that might be five to 10% of the companies, if at all, they may take place, but 90%, more than rather 90% of the companies are compliant. But having said that, you cannot simply say that uh, key, all these companies are uh, may well governed companies and all, and, but wherever it is so required, you need to establish also, just like an independent director is independent, he has to always establish that his independence is not compromised. Same is the case with related party transactions also. So therefore, transparency in case of related party transactions is not only essential, but also very crucial. And the law requires certain specific compliances with respect to related party transactions. So hence, we can say that per se, the related party transactions are not bad. Per se, the related party transactions are not prohibited. This is a, this thing what I want to emphasize here is that sometimes the people think that the moment it is a related party transaction, there is going to be a 
big uh, compliances we have to make. It is nothing that what it says is that related party transactions per se, they are not prohibited. You can do very much and you can, have, you can transact with your related parties. But the only thing what it requires is certain compliances are required. For certain transactions, you require audit committee approval. For certain transactions, you require board approval. For certain transactions, you require both audit and as well as the board approvals. And sometimes when that triggers the limits, you know, the limits are triggered at that point of time, you may have to go to the shareholders also. And all these approvals are prior approvals. Earlier, there used to be a kind of confusion whether it is a prior approval or a post-fact approval can be taken at all. But to a large extent now, all these approvals are prior approvals only. So considering the sensitivity connected with the related party transactions and to develop the legal fabric, both Companies Act 2013 as well as the Savior Listing Regulations 2015, stipulated various stringent compliances and disclosures. And as far as the Savior Listing Regulations are concerned, a lot of changes have taken place, which have some of them have come into effect from 1st April 2022. And the remaining have come from effective from 1st April 2023. So now more or less all the amendments, whatever are there to the same listing regulations, they're all in force by now. Let us see the, what are the types of related party transactions. The transactions with related party may be with respect to purchase or sale of goods, selling or buying a property, leasing of property, availing or rendering of services. So it is rendering of services, not supply of services. That is, there is a slight difference between these two. So financial transactions such as granting of loans or providing of security or guarantees, subscribing to securities, appointment of related party to any office, whether as a director or otherwise, for underwriting the subscription of shares, etc. These are all the various transactions which you can enter into with related parties. Certain transactions may trigger 188 and all the transactions necessarily trigger 177 compliances. Apart from the above, there are certain other transactions out there which may be also with the related parties only, like issuance of securities by way of rights issue, bonus issue, preferential issue, or private placement, buyback of securities, declaration of dividend, appointment of related parties or their relatives as managerial personal, acceptance of fixed deposits, several such other corporate actions. So wherever the corporate actions takes place, which are across the company, that point of time, that compliances with 188 may not be required. Say, for example, there is a rights issue or a bonus issue is there. For these uh, rights issue, bonus issue, that private placement and all these things, 188 may not get triggered. Same as the case with the declaration of dividend. And SEBI, of course, earlier this was a call which was taken by the industry, but now SEBI has in the listing regulations very well covered this that all these transactions are exempted transactions. No specific approvals are required for this, apart from whatever the sections uh, compliance, the, the respective section compliances are there. Now, another important thing, as we know that the duties of directors are there under section 166. There are two duties, especially a director who is a related party, inter alia has to follow the following duties as prescribed. One is, he shall not involve in a situation in which he may have a direct or indirect interest that conflicts or possibly may conflict with the interest of the company. So wherever a director, he is because he is a related party transaction, he is a related party to the company. And whenever he is entering into any kind of transaction or wherever he is interested at that particular entity is entering into a transaction with the company. So he should ensure that, there, that, that whatever the conflict of interest is there, that is to be appropriately to taken care of. And he should not get into such kind of a situation where the conflict of interest is there to the extent possible. A director of a company shall not achieve or attempt to achieve any undue gain or advantage either to himself or to his relatives, partners, associates. That means at the cost of the shareholders, at the cost of the stakeholders of the company, he should not get any kind of benefit either for himself or for any of the people in whom he is having in a kind of interest. So it is very important for the directors, they should exercise due diligence before approving any kind of related party transactions. And also it is the responsibility of other directors and the KMP is to ensure that if any director's conflict of interest is there, that is properly addressed too. So what are the provisions applicable for related party transactions? Of course, if your company is a listed company, then of course, SEBI comes into SEBI regulations come into picture. Otherwise, 
if it is a non list uh, unlisted company only company act 2013 is applicable which is applicable to both public as well as private companies also so now for, as i was mentioning that uh, if you see the company act 2013 to a large extent private companies are more or less at par with the public companies and if the company is a listed company, then Regulation 23 compliances are required. And of course, apart from that thing, the disclosures are required as far as the accounting standards are concerned. Now, how to determine a related party transaction? To determine that whether a related party transaction or not, there are three checks are to be paid primarily. This is what, as a company secretary, I have to do it. First and foremost, in case, whether the party with whom I am entering into a transaction is it my related party or not? The moment I come to, I, if I can determine that is not my related party, there is absolutely no issue that smoothly can enter into the transaction. How to determine that whether the other party is related to me or not? That is, I have to see section two, subsection 76, if my company is an unlisted company. And if my company is a listed company, in addition to that, I have to also refer to rule two, one, gen B. Once it is determined that the party with whom I am entering into a transaction is a related party. The second step I have to say is whether the transaction is being entered into that related party. Is it a related party transaction under section 188, subsection 1? If so, then obviously those compliances are required. Otherwise, those compliances are not required. Then regulation 21ZC of the listing regulations, if it is a listed company. After getting these two checks, the third check is that whether the transaction is being entered into is in the ordinary course of business and at arm's length basis. Because this is an exemption given, very generous exemption according to me. It is given under Section 188 that the transactions what you are entering into, if they are in the ordinary course of business and at an arm's length, then Section 188 is not applicable. But please remember that. This exemption is available only from 188, but not from 177. Hence, all the transactions with the related parties or the transactions referred to under section 188, subsection 1, have to be necessarily routed through section 177. That is, the audit committee approval is very much required. Now, sometimes I also say that this is. Uh, ordinary course of business and an arm's length while availing this exemption. Most of the times, the company secretaries have seen that the transaction is in the ordinary course of business and arm's length and they avail the exemption. But the acid test will come when the regulator comes for an inspection or investigation at any point or a scrutiny at a later stage. The, as I was repeatedly mentioning that the, for the, if I am the regulator, I am going to see section 188 compliances first because this is the most complex section and the most important section as far as the, uh, the related party abuse is concerned. So regulators darling is that section 188 and 177 compliances. So how you have determined a transaction as it is in the ordinary course of business, that is very important. You may say that it is ordinary course of business, but tomorrow the regulator may say, no, I don't agree with that. So you have to substantiate that it is in the ordinary course of business. I will give, I will deal with this particular ordinary course of business a little later, because this is a very important uh, provision. And it one has to understand very clearly how to determine a transaction in the ordinary course of business. And second thing is that it is an arm's length basis. It is not or both the things have to go together that transaction is to be in the ordinary course of business and that transaction which is in the ordinary course of business shall be at an arm's length basis then only that exception can be availed. What is an arm's length basis? Again, we will deal with that little later. Now, let us see the definition of related party as I was mentioning to you. We have to see under section 2, subsection 76. There is absolutely, there is no change in this section is concerned. That's why I'm not going to go into each and every component of this. But certainly, I would like to uh, deal with two major provisions that any body corporate whose board of directors, managing director or manager is accustomed to act in accordance with the advice, directions or instructions of a director or manager, 
of course it is not applicable to the professional capacity and any person on whose advice directions or instructions a director or manager is accustomed to act normally i have seen that tendency is always whenever we have to determine the related parties most of the times the company secretary see that directors relatives kmps relatives then the, the, the forms in which the directors are partners managers their shareholders etc etc things but these two things which we always forget is that is my managing director or managers or my board of directors are accustomed to act as per the instructions of anybody if so whether that party will become that entity or that party that person will become a related party to me am i entering into any transactions with them if so that that amounts to related party transactions so this is a very fundamental thing now the question comes what is accustomed to act there should be instances or documents indicating advice directions or instructions by a director or manager of a company to the board managing director or manager of the other body corporate that means suppose if say there is a holding company is there the holding companies key by the kmps or the directors or the senior managements have to give instructions or advices to the subsidiary company maybe holy world maybe in otherwise or a joint venture or an associate company and if that joint venture associate or subsidiary companies are accustomed to act as per the instructions of the holding company then obviously that holding company becomes a related party irrespective of whether that other uh, it is falling in that subsection 2 sorry section 2 subsection 76 or not but this is one of also the things say for example if you see that 276 promoter is not a related party as per section 2 subsection 76 until recently not even under the listing regulations 2019 for the first time the promoter has been brought into the definition of related party so in such case though the promoter has not directly been defined as a related party but if the company is accustomed to act as per the instructions of the promoter who may not be an executive director or executive capacity but he is barely a promoter or a major shareholder but if he is giving instructions or directions to the company and the board is accustomed to act as per that then such person may become a related party so it is to be that the it is to be established that there has been a series of events that particular advice or instructions should not be a one off transaction when we say that the uh, the company is accustomed to act as per the instructions there should be a series of transactions and events where such directions or instructions have been given and the company has complied with those advisory or the instructions given to that so single isolated events or a two would not be sufficient and at the same point of time it is mere presumption it will not work and there should be a hard core evidence should be there so the person who is alleging that the company is accustomed to act as per the instructions of some xyz then the person who is making that allegation the onus of proof depends upon him to establish that to that this company got accustomed to act as per the instructions now let us come to rule 21 jb this particular thing that uh, if you see uh, it's that simple language it, the listing regulation says that any related party which is defined under section 2 subsection 76 of the companies act 2013 and if such entity is also a related party under the accounting standards like india 18 and uh, india sorry the as 18 and india 24 earlier these were the definition of related parties that means over and above the company act definition that if the related party is covered under the accounting standards those are the related parties as far as the listing regulations are concerned as i was mentioning that in neither of this clearly promoter is not covered again accounting standards may be exercising significant control and all those things that is an indirect way of covering but direct way of covering is not there so april 1st 2019 for the first time it has been brought into that any person or entity belonging to the promoter or promoter group of the listed entity and holding 20% or more of the share holding in the listed entity shall be deemed to be related party here also what it says is if you see the wording it is promoter or promoter group of the listed entity any person belongs to 
or entity belongs to. That means what it is not the group entirely holding 20%, but it is to be on the individual basis only. But so very rarely that any person or entity uh, belongs to the promoter group holding 20% or more. So this has not cut much ice as far as the amendment is concerned. Now, effective 1st April 2022, this has been further amended. Now it says that any person or entity forming a part of the promoter or promoter group of the listed entity, that means irrespective of the holding, even if an entity or a person's name is there as a part of promoter or promoter group, disclosure to the stock exchanges, even if they are holding nil shares, but still they are related parties. Earlier it was 20% plus shareholding, but now it is nil shareholding also. But if your name is a part of that promoter or promoter group, you will be a rental party. Second, any person or entity holding equity shares of 20% or more and 10% or more effective 1st April 23. So now, as far as for all purposes, we have to say that any person or entity, even if they are not belonging to the promoter or promoter group, if that person or entity holding more than 10% of more of the share capital, then in the listed entity, either directly or on a beneficial interest basis as provided under Section 89, at any time during the immediate preceding financial year. See, this is a very, very important provision that, that means any individual or any company which is holding more than 10% of your shareholding or 20%, of course, that is up to 31st March 23, it is 20% and after that it is 10%. In the immediately preceding financial year. So for the purpose of suppose 23-24, if I have to determine a related party, I have to see which are the persons or entities, though they doesn't belong to promoter or promoter group, holding 20% or more in the preceding financial year. And effective... So if they are holding in the preceding financial year 20% or more, they will become related parties of the company during the financial year 23-24. And during this particular financial year, they may not be having any shareholding also, but still they become related parties. Similarly, for the next financial year, that is 24-25, if any individual or entity is holding more than 10% of the shareholding during the year 23-24, they become related parties in the financial year 24-25. So this is one important feature one has to understand that. So if you see the what are the action points arisen out of the, uh, the definition is that it includes all persons or entities belonging to the promoter or promoter group. So basically you have, when you are uh, preparing the list of related parties, you have to put all the promoter and promoter group at one spot place. And after that, you have to see that from your ROM, who are the persons or entities holding more than 20% in your previous financial year or 10% or more in the current financial year like that. And then you have to put them also into the related party category and monitor these shareholdings at regular intervals because it says that at any point of time during the immediately preceding financial year means even on a single particular day, if that holding was there subsequently prior to or after that it is not there, it is immaterial. So you have to monitor the, your ROM at regular intervals to determine that whether a particular person or entity is a related party or not. So if you see the essence of the related party definition, the Companies Act, it is very explicit. And as far as the accounting standards are concerned, they're very extensive. And as far as the listing regulations are concerned, they're very exhaustive. That, that's what I can say. Companies Act is explicit. Accounting standards are extensive and listing regulations are exhaustive. Now let us see the related party transactions. Again, the same thing. First, once you determine that, who are my related parties, then whose responsibility is this to, de to determine the related parties? It is the responsibility of the secretarial department because of late I came to know that this issue is coming up, whether it is the responsibility of the finance department or responsibility of the secretarial department or a combined responsibility. So according to me, determination of related parties, it is primarily the responsibility of the secretarial department because 
the amount of information what is available with them based on that only applying to the sections, they can determine the list of related parties, which is to be given to the finance and accounts department. Then question comes about the related party transactions. So when we share that list of related parties to our colleagues in the finance and accounts, we have to say that in case you are entering into any transaction, that means the company is entering into any transaction with these list of parties, please do escalate it to us and we will ensure the necessary compliances wherever the approvals are to be obtained and all those things which we have to do it. So the identification or determination of related party transactions, though it rests with the, again, secretarial department only, but that is to be the transactions are to be escalated because secretarial on its own cannot do that. So the escalation has to take place by the finance and accounts. Why I'm emphasizing this particular factor is of late I came to know that there is a kind of uh, what's called as misunderstanding or the lack of understanding, let me put it this way, that who has to do what exactly. So I always say that here finance and accounts, especially on the revised regulation 23 is concerned. The responsibility is of both the departments and they have to work hand in glove with that. So if related party transactions of uh, under section 188 are concerned, as I told you that section 188 subsection 1, it gives from A to F that sale or purchase or supply of any goods or materials, sale, selling or disposing of property of any kind, leasing of property of any kind, availing and rendering of services, appointment of any agent for purchase or sale of goods of material or property. So like this, this is all there. There is absolutely no change as far as it is concerned. The only thing is that whenever these transactions are being entered into, and these transactions are to be approved by the board at the meeting by way of passing a resolution. That is a, the primary requirement is there. Of course, in the agenda, when you're circulating the agenda items and you know, what sort of information you have to furnish, that is all there in the rules. But the only important thing what you have to remember is that you cannot pass the resolution, the board cannot give its approval for section 188 transactions by way of a circular resolution because that resolution is to be passed at the board meeting only. And with the consent of the, except with the consent of the board, that means it is the prior approval is required. And a resolution is also required you know, because again, the same thing that sometimes people ask this question, why? Because any decision of the board is to be taken by way of a resolution only. So why specifically it has been asked in the resolution? So just for the benefit of the participants, let me say that every board decision need not be by way of a resolution unless and it is specifically asked under the act. Wherever the act is asking that the board has to approve by passing a resolution means necessarily you have to have the resolution. Other things that you can always put it in a narrative form as far as your minutes are concerned. So there are certain transactions which are exempted from the 188. As I told you, the major exemption is under the ordinary course of business and at an arm's length basis. However, for such transactions, there is no exemption from obtaining the approval of audit committee under what 77, so that is to be obtained. And transactions which doesn't exceed the threshold limits which are prescribed under Rule 15, if I am not wrong, are exempted from obtaining shareholders' approval. And in case of listed companies, only material related party transactions requires the shareholders' approval. In case of a private company, the restrictions that related parties shall not vote on a resolution approving the related party transactions is not applicable. In case of public companies, the related parties cannot vote on the resolution. In case of listed companies, the related parties cannot vote while approving the resolution. That means they can vote in a negation, but not in a positive way. In case of wholly owned subsidiaries, the resolutions passed by the holding company shall be sufficient for the purpose of entering into a transaction between the wholly owned subsidiary and holding company. That means if there is a relationship of a wholly owned and the wholly owned subsidiary and holding company, then if that holding company, whatever the approval it is obtaining from its shareholders will be sufficient. And the wholly owned subsidiary did not take the approval of the holding company once again. And shareholders approval is not required in certain cases like the transaction is between two government companies or the transaction is between the holding company and its wholly owned subsidiary provided that wholly owned subsidiary is consolidating its accounts with the holding company. 
Now let us see the key terminology of the RT. This is what I say that what is the meaning of the term key terminology means. In order, in order to appreciate the nuances of related party transactions, we have to understand this, like your ordinary course of business, arms length, what is the goods, property, etc., etc. Let us see that quickly. Goods, we all know by now that goods does not mean only the goods. Even the shares are concerned. You know, Section 2, subsection 7 of Sale of Goods Act says goods as every kind of mobile property other than the actionable clients and money and includes stocks and shares. So that's why shares are part of goods. And whenever you are selling or buying the shares from a related party, compliances under Section 188 are very much required. But one has to note that goods, that means the shares come into existence only at the time of allotment. So prior to, at the time of issue, the shares are not in existence, so the goods are not there. So only question of sale or purchase of goods is possible when they come into existence. And they come into existence as far as the shares are concerned only on the allotment. That's why when issuance of shares is not a related party transaction, that's why 188 approval is not required. But once the issue of shares to a related party, certainly 177 approval is required. So subscription of shares is not purchase of shares. Transmission of shares is not sale of shares. Transfer of shares by way of gift is not sale of shares. So for subscription of shares, transmission of shares, transfer of shares, 188 uh, compliances are not required. Whether allotment of shares, I can put one question, just to you know a kind of an FAQ, I can say this, whether allotment of shares to a related party is a related party transaction under Section 188, answer is no, because issue and allotment of shares is not considered as a related party transaction, which was I was mentioning earlier, because the shares come into existence only after the allotment. Now, the second thing is the office of place of profit. Office of place of profit means an office or place or position which gives the person holding such office some pecuniary gain or advantage or benefit. So when there is a, by merely holding the office is not sufficient, there should be some kind of a pecuniary gain or advantage or benefit, then it will become under the office or place of profit and compliances are required. The amount of such benefit is irrelevant, whether it is a, 100 rupees or a 1,000 rupees or a lack of rupees, it is a material. Whether it is there or not, the pecuniary gain or advantage or benefit is there or not there. The main purpose is to prevent a director or his relative from holding the office of place of profit and encashing the profits, carrying total monthly remuneration beyond the prescribed limits, and thereby put in his pocket directly or indirectly over and above the remuneration, whatever they are getting it and whatever they are entitled for. So section 188, subsection 1 defines office or place of profit as a director holding it receives from the company anything by way of remuneration over and above that what he is entitled as a director. That means if I am a managing director, what I am entitled for? I am entitled for my salary and perquisites. So if I get anything over and above my salary and perks, that amounts to an office or place of profit. Suppose if I'm a non-executive director, what I'm entitled for? I'm entitled for a profit-linked commission. So over and above that, or maybe I'm entitled for my sitting fees or reimbursement of expenses. So if I get anything over and above that, that amounts to office or place of profit. Again, for example, the managing director of XYZ Limited and XYZ Limited is, say, for example, engaged in the manufacturing of medicines. And XYZ Limited wants to get a software developed for its manufacturing operations. And its managing director, Mr. A, is a qualified software expert having the ability to develop that kind of a software. So the company has floated tenders and he also has participated in that. And his quote was 15 lakhs and the next lowest quote was say 2 crore rupees. So is this transaction a section 180 transaction or not? So when I have to examine that, how I have to see that? First and foremost thing is, is that party, I am entering into a transaction with Mr. A. Is Mr. A my related party? Yes, Mr. A is a managing director of the company, so he is my related party. So second thing is, 
Second uh, asset test, what I have to put it is, is it an officer place of profit? Answer is yes, because he is entitled for his salary and requisites. Now what happened is he is doing, he is rendering some service, which is not a part of his what is, I mean, okay, that day-to-day -day things are uh, which an agreement was entered into over and above what he is supposed to do. He is now rendering a separate service as such to the company for which he is getting a, a kind of a uh, what's called as a you know, consideration over and above what he was entitled for as a managing director. So obviously it is holding a place of profit and it triggers section 188. Then the third thing what I have to put it is, is it in the ordinary course of business? And at arm's length. Yes, it is in the ordinary course of business because that manufacturing of medicines company is developing a software for its manufacturing process. So it is in the ordinary course of business. And is that in an arm's length basis? Answer is again yes, because the lowest court, what was next to Mr. A's court is 2 crore rupees and he has quoted 50 lakh rupees. So obviously, we can determine that it is an arm's length basis. So because of all these things, despite the fact it is triggers 188, because it is a holding of office of place of profit, but this is an exempted transaction under the ordinary course of business and at arm's length. But since he is the managing director, what he, though he, it is exempted under 188, it requires the approval of the audit committee under 177. At the same point of time, it also requires approval of the shareholders under 197 subsection 4. Though it doesn't require approval under 188, it requires approval of the shareholders under 197 4. And also the NRC approval because it is that he is getting some comes consideration over and above what he is entitled for. So NRC also comes into picture. So you have to have NRC approval, you have to have audit committee approval, and you have to also have the shareholders approval. Now let us see the ordinary course of business. And this is a very important thing that because most of the times we take that it is in the ordinary course of business. But what is ordinary course of how you are determining that? To say a transaction in the ordinary course of business is very subjective, it is judgmental. It can vary on case-to-case -case basis, giving consideration to the nature of business and objects of the entity. So the act uses the term ordinary course of business, but it is not defined that what is ordinary course of business. In fact, in 2014, when Companies Act was enforced, several people have approached the ministry that please define the ordinary course of business. Thank God that I said this several times that ministry hasn't got tempted to define the ordinary course of business because you can determine what is ordinary course of business for you. The moment somebody else is defining that, then you have to play in the four walls only. That would have restricted you from getting this exemption. But, but as I was telling that, the good sense prevailed that ministry has not defined the ordinary course of business and left it to the companies. So it is a great responsibility on the company secretaries to determine what is ordinary course of business. And maybe sometimes the in the real party transaction policy that who will determine the ordinary course of business? It is basically the audit committee which has to do that, for which the guidelines are to be provided under the red party transaction policy. So now I will give an example of uh, what is how to determine an ordinary course of business. Say, for example, to understand that, I will give an example. Several times I give an example of my own company. I used to say that Reliance Industries Limited, because for the easy purpose of understanding, and for me also, it is easy to explain. Say, for example, Reliance is purchasing a chunk of land from a related party near to its refinery at Jamnagar. And this related party, is it a related party transaction? Answer is yes, because I am purchasing a property, right? And this property is being purchased from a related party. Now the question comes, is that land what I am purchasing? And is it in the ordinary course of business? Can I simply say yes or no? I cannot. That is what I say most of the times whenever I ask this question in the physical meetings. Is it in the ordinary course of business? Some people say no because its, it's main manufacturing is refined rate. So it has to refine the crude oil. It is not to purchase the land. So they say no. But some people say yes. The company requires some land to, uh, to, to, to take care of the business and all. But... Question is, when you are determining it is in the ordinary course of business or not, 
you have to see that what is the purpose for which I am purchasing that land. That is more important. So when I'm purchasing the land, suppose if I'm purchasing it for construction of houses, the staff quarters, so that where are the people working in the refinery, they can stay within the township itself. So to construct the staff quarters and give it to the employees to stay there. Is it my ordinary course of business? Answer is yes, because it is for furtherance of my business activities. I need to give to my employees because they cannot stay at far off places and come to the works every day. So it is beneficial for them as well as to the company that they stay near to the refinery. So for that, I need to develop the staff quarters for which I am purchasing the land. Yes, it is in the ordinary course of business. Second, again, in another instance, I am not providing the staff quarters, but again, I am purchasing the land. And this time, that land, what I am purchasing, again, I am constructing the houses there. And I am giving an offer to my employees stating that if you work for a period of five years, you can stay in the same house by paying a nominal rent till the time that house is transferred in your name. And if you work for five years, at the end of five years, you will get the house at X price, which is much lesser than what the prevailing market price. Is it in the ordinary course of business? Again, answer is yes, because here what I'm doing is just like employee stock options. I am giving a benefit to my employees. I am giving something to uh, some kind of a benefit to them if they work with me for a particular period of time because I need that kind of a continuity and consistency in my employment. So I'm giving an offer to them. This is again furtherance of my business. So I can always justify that it is in the ordinary course of business. The third situation is that, again, same thing. I am neither providing a staff quarters nor offering it to my employees, but I have purchased a land, constructed houses, and I am asking that anybody and everybody can purchase the houses is it in the ordinary course of business? Answer is no, because it is not in furtherance of my business. It is a separate business altogether, as if I am going to enter into it. Like a builder, I am purchasing the land, I am constructing the houses. Anybody and everybody can buy it from me. So it is not in the ordinary course of business. So the three examples what I have given, this is how we have to examine that. Is it uh, the particular activity, what I'm doing, it. what is the purpose of that, whether it is purchase, sale, anything? What is the purpose? Is that particular purpose is for furtherance of my business? If it is yes, I can jolly well say that it is in the ordinary course of business. So only if a manufacturing company is acquiring another, for the purpose of its diversification, it decides to acquire another company. Say, for example, a paint manufacturing company is acquiring another paint manufacturing company from a related party. Now, is that a related party transaction? Again, answer is yes. It is a related party transaction because it, you are acquiring a, the, a paint manufacturing company from another person who is related to you. Is it in the ordinary course of business? Again, my answer is yes, because it is for furtherance of my business. It's not when I'm going to expand my activities, when I'm acquiring the another company, which is into the same line of business, I can always say for furtherance of business, I'm acquiring this company. Instead of setting up a greenfield venture, I'm acquiring a ready-made company, which is available for sale. Even if it is from a related party, of course, it should be an arm's length basis. That is a different thing. But what here we are trying to do is determination of ordinary course of business. But the business, what I'm acquiring, the paint manufacturing company is acquiring from the surplus cash available with it, which is a pharmaceutical company. Is it in the ordinary course of business? Answer is no. If that acquisition is from a related party, you have to comply with all the procedural rigmaroles because it is not for furtherance of my business because it is altogether a new business. So you have to just, you can do it by all means, but you have to comply with whatever the requirements out there. This is how you have to see the ordinary course of business. So further to just give some more object, I mean, the add-ons to that is if whenever I have to determine what is the ordinary course of business, whatever I have explained, the fundamental thing is if it is for furtherance of my business, I can definitely say that. In addition to that, there may be certain other parameters which may also be helpful to you. 
whether the activity is covered in the objects clause of memorandum, whether the activity is for furtherance of my business, whether that activity is a regular transaction or a one-off transaction, whether the transactions are common in that particular industry, whether the revenue generated is shown as a business income, the financial scale of activity with regard to the operations of business. If it is a minuscule activity, I may not be able to say in the ordinary course of business. Revenue generated by the activity, that is also equally important. If it is 1% of my revenue generating, then I say it is my ordinary course of business, nobody will accept to that. Then what are the resources I am committing to that particular activity? So these are all certain parameters based on which will help you to determine what is my ordinary course of business. So who determines? As I mentioned earlier, it is the audit committee which has to do it. The act does not clearly lay down that who will determine the ordinary course of business, but primarily it is the responsibility of the audit committee which has to give approval for every transaction with a related party. And the audit committee may decide whether a particular transaction is in the ordinary course of business and such decision will be based on the policy on transactions with related parties. This is what I told you. The board has to give guidance to the audit committee how to determine the ordinary course of business in the policy on related party transactions. Now, what is arm's length transaction? By definition, it is also, of course, defined under Section 188, a transaction between two related parties that is conducted as if they were unrelated so that there is no conflict of interest. The term arm's length basis means a bundle of terms and conditions, including price and not the price alone, in isolation of other terms and conditions. Most of the times what we think that is arm's length transaction means people say that it is arm's length pricing. It is not pricing, it is the bundle of terms of transactions. Let us see again this one also how it comes to. So explanation to subsection 1 of section 188 defines the term arm's length transaction as a transaction between two related parties that is conducted as if they were unrelated so that there is no conflict of interest. So that means the, the transaction should be above the board. It should be the transparency should be there. These are the two primary requirements for that. So as I mentioned to you, price is just one of the components of the terms of dealing with the other party. There are several other terms which may be there. So the entire bundle of terms and conditions, say for example, I am dealing with a related party for purchase of certain goods. Mr. A is my related party and Mr. B is not related to me. And B is supplying that 100 rupees a kilo to me, just for the sake of uh, understanding, I'm saying 100 rupees per kilo. Whereas A is giving me at 85 rupees a kilo. Can I say that arm's length is this transaction at arm's length basis? Again, the same thing when I ask this question in the physical betting, several times people say, yes, it is arm's length transaction. I say, why? Because they say it is 85 rupees vis-a-vis -vis 100 rupees. That is not the case. Suppose if the price is not the only determining factor, apart from that thing, what is the credit period? To Mr. A, I am giving a six months credit. And Mr. B, I am giving only one week credit. Is it okay? Answer is no. At the same point of time, Mr. A can deliver the goods what I have ordered to him. Maybe after, say, for example, within two months, he can supply to me. Whereas Mr. B has to supply to me within a week. Is it okay? So like this, there are bundle of terms and conditions whenever you are entering into a commercial transaction. Pricing is one part. Delivery terms, quality of material, discounts, pricing, so many other things are there. So all the things are to be at par and there should not be any kind of conflict of interest. If I am dealing with Mr. B, on the same terms and conditions, if I am dealing with Mr. A who is related to me, then only I can say it is arm's length transaction. So for arriving at arm's length transaction, one may check if there are comparable products in the market. If yes, check the terms of sale and purchase, etc. of similar transactions and try obtaining quotes from other sources. Price and isolation cannot be the only criteria. Terms of sale of such credit terms should be also be considered. It is not mandatory to obtain a certificate because you know, sometimes people think that I, have, I am taking a quotation from two, three parties for arms to justify my arms length transaction 
or I am getting the transaction valued by a valuer. By merely doing that, it is not the end of it. As I was mentioning to you, you have to ensure that if the terms and conditions are there, then of course you have to establish, no doubt about it, all these backup papers will be supporting your, your uh, what's called as a, arriving at arm's length transaction. But that is not the only criteria which will safeguard you. You have to establish that all the terms and conditions are at par. So these are certain methods which are uh, the, based on the transfer pricing guidelines. These are certain methods of determining the valuation as far as arm's length pricing is concerned. Now let us come to the RPT under the listing regulation. So, so far what we have seen is the related party transactions under Companies Act. At the same point of time, we have also seen certain key terminology as far as the related party transactions are concerned, which is equally important. Now let us see that the definition of related party under the, uh, uh, the listing regulations. So rule 21 JETC, it defines the related party transaction. Earlier that the uh, definition was like a related party transaction is a transfer of resources, services or obligations between a company and a related party regardless of whether a price is charged or not. So this is a very exhaustive definition by itself because it says that a related party transaction is transfer of resources. What is the resource? It is a huge, it is a very wide term. So transfer of resources is a related party transaction. Then services. Again, what is services? More or less, you can bring everything and anything also into services. It is not clearly defined in the listing regulations or in the Companies Act. So you have to fall back upon the nearest definition available with you. Then comes about the obligation. What is an obligation? That is also, again, a, which is not defined anywhere as such. And over and above all these things, when transfer of all these things, regardless of whether a price is charged or not. So that means pricing is not at all a criteria for arriving at a real party transaction or not. Because sometimes it may so happen without even paying for the service or for the product, still you can give a lot of benefit to the other party. I used to give an example always that suppose if somebody is rendering some service, say for example, a company like again, I take my own company's example, Reliance Industries, and he's not charging me anything for that. Is it a related party transaction or not? It is a related party transaction provided the other person is related to me and falling in the definitions. So, but I am not paying anything. He is not charging anything to me. Then why it is to be the compliances are required? Because the moment he is making a supply to me, he will put in his profile that he is a supplier to Reliance Industries Limited. That itself will give him an extra mileage. That itself will give him a great benefit as far as his business or his profession is concerned. That's why in the listing regulations, very aptly, they have brought this concept of whether the price is charged or not. A transaction shall be construed to include a single transaction or a group of transactions in a contract at very wide scope as, as far as the Companies Act is concerned. Now, this, amount, this particular definition has gone undergone an amendment which is came into effect from 1st April 2022. And again, part of this has come into force from 1st April 2023. Now, we are already having, we are in July 23. So the entire amendment to real party transaction is came into force now for this financial year 23-24. So what is the, uh, the new amendments which have concerned? Let us see that. Related party transaction means involving a transfer of resources, services, or obligations. There is no change to up to here between a listed entity or any of its subsidiaries on one hand and a related party of the listed entity or any of its subsidiaries on the other hand. So this is a very enlarged definition. It is covering both the listed entity and its subsidiaries on one side. And on the other side, the related party of the listed entity as well as of the related party of its subsidiaries on the other hand. That means if listed entity is dealing with the related party of its subsidiaries, it is a related party transaction, which was not so earlier. Similarly, if the subsidiaries are dealing with the related parties of the listed entity, again, it is a related party transaction. So the scope is very wide. End. In addition to that, Effective April 23, a new 
definition as I mean, new amendment is also coming into force that stating a listed entity or any of its subsidiaries on one hand and any other person or entity on the other hand. That means that any other person or entity, they are not related to neither to the listed entity nor to the subsidiary. Okay. That means listed entity or its subsidiaries or entering into a transaction with any other person or entity, despite the fact they are not related, but the purpose and effect of that particular transaction is to benefit a related party of the listed entity or any of its subsidiaries. That means if I am entering into a transaction with an entity or a person and the purpose is and the purpose and effect of that particular transaction is to give a benefit to my related party, that means to the related party of the listed entity or to the related parties of any of its subsidiaries. This is a very, I mean, in fact, you know, key that, uh, I mean, it's not that simple to understand that by which kind of transactions are there like this. Because all the transactions so far we have, we have seen is purchase, sale, rendering, availing services, sale of property, purchase of property, blah, 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 things are there. These are the transactions which are visible and which we enter into directly between two parties that transactions are taking place. Whereas here it is that in the new amendment, what is happening is you are entering into a transaction with somebody. The purpose and effect of that transaction is to benefit somebody else. So this is what normally with this amendment, if you see that earlier, the, the several transactions were taking place beneath the surface. That means among this at the subsidiary level only. So that because those parties are not related parties to the listed entity, the compliance is what were expected under the listing regulations was not taking place. So because of that, what happened was, now you have to bring those transactions above the surface for which what you have to do is, you have to bring the transactions of the, from the, what's called by the subsidiaries with the related parties of the listed entities. Because when you are consolidating the subsidiaries' financials with the listed entities' financials, definitely this kind of uh, what's called as the compliances are very much required. And similarly, this as far as the second part of the amendment is concerned, these are all the most of the I can say that these are camouflaged transactions, or we can say structured transactions, which are again you are trying to beat the law in fact you know, if i if i am if i say so that you are trying to maneuver the law in such a way that you don't need to comply with these kind of transactions earlier or there but actually this amendment has tapped that particular kind of transactions also so regardless of the price whether charged or not that is there also intact so with this new amendment what is happening? The transaction between the listed entity and related party of the listed entities, they are related party transactions as it was earlier also. Similarly, transactions between subsidiary of listed entity and its related parties, again, the same thing, it was there earlier also. The new thing is that the transaction between the listed entity and related party of subsidiary. Similarly, the transaction between the subsidiary of listed entity and the related party of the listed entities then the transactions between subsidiaries and related parties of other subsidiaries. That means you can say that you have to ensure that at a global level, the compliances have to take place. At the, especially in case of big group of companies, they have to ensure that all these kind of inter cross transactions, I mean, the, the cross transactions are interrelated transactions. All these things are to be identified, captured properly, compliances are to be ensured properly and all those things. Hence, now RPTs are entered by subsidies are also to be approved as they are going to impact the consolidated financials. As I told you that, let us also just go through this second amendment which has come into force from 1st April 2023. As I told you that the transaction between the listed entity and any other person entity, any other person or entity, the purpose and effect of which is to benefit the related party or the related subsidiary. So how, uh, I mean, how you can give the purpose and effect means what? Say, for example, if I have to give, say, a 5 crore rupees loan to my related party 
obviously this will come to the scrutiny. So what I am going to do is simply I am going to this five crores to a person who is not related to me. Obviously, I don't need to make any complaints other than your whatever you are 186, 185. These things you have to see that, but 188 is not getting triggered. So related party transactions, the approval of the the board, committee, shareholders, and all those things, I can avoid it. So if I am structuring a transaction like this, that I give that 5 crore, 50 crore, 100 crores, whatever it is to X, that X will be giving the same amount as a loan to a related party of mine. So the purpose of my giving loan is to give an effect to my related party. So because of that, this transaction between me and the person or entity who is not related, that also is a related party transaction. So second thing is the transaction between the subsidiary and any other person entity. Again, the same thing, whether it is the listed entity doing or subsidiary doing the same kind of transaction. If the purpose and effect is give a benefit to the related party of the listed entity or of its subsidiary, definitely that particular transaction is also a related party transaction and they have to do it. So various combination of transactions included within the ambit of related party transactions. So sometimes the question comes whether it is a purpose or effect, but the words used is purpose and effect. So mere purpose is not sufficient. Suppose I gave a loan, no doubt about it that Mansuria might be that why that particular party has to give a loan to my related party, but somehow it has not happened. So that means what it is a simple loan transaction from my side, from the listed entity to an unknown party. But the effect has not taken place for whatever the reasons it is. Is it coming under the related party transaction? Answer is no. Because the purpose and effect both are to be there, then only it will fall under the definition of related party transaction. Mere purpose is not sufficient. Effect is equally important. So now, as I told you, normally these transactions are structured transactions and they always give a kind of concealed benefit, not entered in that. So how to identify these transactions? As I told you that you have, I am giving something to somebody and that somebody will be giving to somebody. Is it in the ordinary course of business? Answer is no. I am structuring this transaction. So always these kind of transactions, these are all structured transactions or engineered transactions. And they're exceptional in nature. They are not, by default, they never happen. These are all not in the day-to-day -day, transactions never takes place. These are exceptional transactions. So if I am an audit committee member, and if I have to see that whether this kind of transactions are there or not there, I as an audit committee member may not be able to identify that. Even the case of an auditors also, they have to be very careful. If not, it is impossible, but it is very difficult to identify these kind of transactions. So one has to see that which are the major transactions. See, normally these kind of structured transactions will not be a minuscule transactions. They will be high value transactions. So one has to see that to identify this, what kind of high value transactions are there, which are abnormal, which are not normal, which are not in the ordinary course of business, which are exceptional in nature. So these are the transactions. This is how we have to do it. Maybe a kind of, I won't say that it is a forensic kind of thing, but you can say you can do something like that. So sometimes it may also trigger the provisions of when they come to the surface, may, may trigger the provisions of 407. So audit committee and auditors may ask for confirmation. The only thing is how to safeguard it. Okay? Because the several because now what happens is that we will discuss that also. It is the independent directors who are members of the audit committee who only have to approve the related party transactions. Now, how the so much of uh, arduous and uh, what's called the immense responsibilities which have been entrusted upon the audit committee members, how they have to insulate themselves. This is a very difficult thing. So maybe to some extent that a certificate from the CFO of the company that no such transactions have taken place, it may give a kind of a comfort or a solace to the audit committee members. So as I told you that this is the of course, audit committee, they need not probe and you know, audit committee need not get perturbed with this kind of things and occupy okay, that if they in fact, I you know that uh, several times uh, when I go as faculty to other, I mean, the, the training programs to the director, this question is asked that how I have to insulate myself as an independent director. So it is very difficult to say how you will insulate yourself as an independent director. You have to be vigilant and you have to be diligent. Keep your eyes and ears open. That's it. So here also, do I need to probe every transaction? I don't need to because it is humanly impossible to probe each and every transaction. But the only thing is you should be, whatever the information being given to you, 
that information you have to go through it properly thoroughly and wherever you have some kind of a lack of understanding is there be uh, i mean very clear from the cfo or company secretary understand the transactions at the same point of time sometimes even as a company secretary what is my responsibility no doubt about it it is your responsibility because you are the compliance officer sometimes you may not even know what is happening so you have to uh, what's called as you know ki that uh, sometimes we have to uh, uh, i mean what called sensitize the cfo ceos board as far as the compliance part is concerned sometimes it may so happen that it is very easy to say but it is very difficult to implement that is what people say but no doubt about it a time has come that recently in one of the training program which i was giving to a board i said the same thing that a time has come now neither the company secretary nor the cfo nor the ceo nor the board in isolation they can ensure the compliance they have to put their heads and hands together and have to collectively to operate to ensure the compliance especially as far as rpts are concerned and same is the case with the insider trading regulations are concerned company secretary though he is the compliance officer he himself cannot do in isolation he cannot ensure the compliance that is what i conclude i come to now if i see the action points just to summarize the whole thing procure the list of related parties from every subsidiary and identifying the ongoing transactions of the listed entity with the related party of such subsidiaries of course these action points were there in the first april 22 itself and maybe some transactions on first april 23 also but one thing is definitely clear even for the future also related party lists are to be prepared at the global level means at the at the at, at the, the the holding company level what its related parties its subsidiaries related parties and similarly because every every related party is a related party to others also and all those things so one has to be very clear that sharing of information as far as the relationships are concerned between each other is very very important then furnish the list of related parties of the listed entity to every subsidiary and procure the information of the ongoing transactions another important thing is suppose some of the ongoing transactions because of the change in definitions certain transactions which were not material related party transactions earlier and now they might have become material related party transactions because earlier it was 10% of consolidated turnover whereas now it is 1000 crores which are is lower so you have to be very careful so you have to see that which are the transactions which are ongoing basis the transactions are there though for the past they may not require such an approval but for the future they do require those approvals that you have to ensure it procure the information about the nature and quantum of transactions of the subsidiaries with its related parties and as i told you that a closer coordination between the financial controllers legal secretarial teams and business teams of listed entities and subsidiaries shall be ensured these are all the exempted transactions under listing regulations that uh, payment of dividends subdivision of consolidation of securities issuance of securities by way of rights and bonus by way of securities acceptance of fixed deposits by banks or non banking finance companies at the terms uniformly applicable and offered to all the shareholders properly however it is subject to disclosure of the same along with the disclosure part related body transactions which we have to do it every month under regulation 23 sub regulation 9 so earlier also these transactions we were taking these transactions as because they are all corporate actions which are across the corporates not for a specific but a segment of people only but now cbi has very clearly said that these transactions are not related to transactions provisions of uh, the sub regulation 234 of regulation 23 are not applicable in case of transactions between two government companies transactions entered between a holding company and its wholly owned subsidiary whose accounts are consolidated with such holding company and placed before the shareholders so if the consolidation takes place then only the exemption is available if the consolidation is not taking place the exemption will not be available because sometimes it may so happen the ultimate company is consolidating its accounts so intermediary companies might not be consolidating the accounts in such case this exemption is not available one has to be very careful when you are taking a call whether to consolidate or not to consolidate the exemption has now been extended to a transaction between two wholly owned subsidiaries also 
because the transactions entered into between two wholly owned subsidiaries of the listed holding company. But again, the same thing, accounts are to be consolidated with such holding company and placed before the shareholders at the general meeting for approval. That means if I am having two wholly owned subsidiaries, if one WOS is consolidated, the other one is not consolidated, then again, the exemption is not available. Both wholly owned subsidiary company accounts have to consolidate with the listed entity. Then in such case, the transactions entered into between these two wholly owned subsidiaries are exempted. Now let us see that material related party transaction. So the listed entity has to formulate a policy on material related party transactions and on dealing with the related party transactions. This policy has to uh, include clear thresholds which are to be approved by the board and that is this kind of policy is to be reviewed at least from I mean, periodically but at least uh, once in three years. And the audit committee of a listed entity shall define what is a material modification and it has to disclose it as a part of the policy on materiality of the related party transactions because any kind of material modification to that related party, material related party transactions also to be approved by the audit committee. Now, what is material related party transactions? Prior to amendment, as I mentioned earlier again, it shall be considered material if the transaction to be entered into individually or taken together with the previous transactions during a financial year, if it exceeds 10% of the annual consolidated turnover, as per the last audited financial statements, it is a material related party transaction. The base for a company like Reliance, if I have my consolidated turnover, say approximately 450,000 crores, so 10% of that, so 45,000 crores, if I exceed any transaction, that is my related party transaction earlier. Then only I have to go to the shareholders, not otherwise. Whereas now, again, it has gone on a change. It, similarly, another uh, this thing also is there a transaction involving payments made to related parties with respect to brand usage or royalty. For that material related party transaction parameters are different. Such transactions shall be considered material if the transactions to be entered into individually are taken together with the previous transactions. It exceeds 5% of the annual consolidated turnover of the listed entity as per the last audited financial statement. So 10% for overall, as far as the royalty and brand usage is concerned, it is only 5% of the annual consolidated turnover. Now, effective 1st April 2022, this definition also had undergone a change. If the transactions to be entered into individually are taken together with previous transactions during a financial year, up to here it is the same. If it exceeds rupees 1000 crore or 10% of the annual consolidated turnover of the listed entity as per the last audited financial statements of the listed entity, whichever is lower. That means it is exceeding 1000 crore or 10% of the annual consolidated turnover of the listed entity, whichever is lower. So most of the times it happens if it is a very big companies, 1000 crores is obviously always lower. So you have to take that as the ballpark figure. Some of the high value transactions, what is the purpose of this thing is because earlier it was felt that some of the high value transactions which were not captured properly because they are coming under the 10% uh, this thing, but still it is, uh, high value transactions, say, as I was mentioning to you, that RIL 450,000 crores consolidated turnover. So, 45,000 crores is, though it is not a big as far as that company size is concerned, but regulator felt that it is a sizable transaction. But according to me, whenever you see sizable transaction, it is not the numerical what is important. It is the overall, you have to see the company's scenario that when you say that these approvals are required and all those things, when you are looking at a balance sheet of 450,000 crore consolidated turnover, and you say 1,000 crores, you go to the shareholders to the approval, it is not fair, but that is the law which we have to comply with. The amount for determining materiality in respect of a particular related party will be the aggregated value of all related party transactions, even though they may not be of the same nature and particularly transacted by the listed entity, and partially by the subsidiary. So it is not only by the listed entity it has to be done. 
that when I'm arriving at the material related party transaction, when I'm talking about the figures, I have to take both the transactions off with that particular party, whether by myself or by my subsidiaries also. Since only the explanation is amended in the listing regulations, the amendment shall not affect the definition pertaining to brand usage or royalty payments of related parties. That means what? That 5% of consolidated turnover as far as the brand usage and royalty is concerned, that is intact. So this 1,000 crores limit is not going to come as on the way of that particular approvals for related party, uh, sorry, the material related party definition as far as the brand usage and royalties are concerned. So under regulation 23.8, all existing material related party transactions or contracts entered into prior to the date of notification of these regulations and which may continue beyond such date shall be placed for approval of the shareholders in the first general meeting subsequent to notification of these regulations. So if I read this thing that this was applicable on 1st December 2015 also, and this is applicable even as on 1st April 2022 also because all the existing material related party contracts or arrangements entered into that means under the new definition, whatever the transactions entered into prior to the date of notification of these regulations, if they are going to, and which may continue beyond that date, that means in future it is going to be there. And in future, if it is going to be there, that it requires approval of the shareholders in the first general meeting, whatever is taking place after the notification of these regulations. So hence, one need to review the material related party transactions under the revised definition and ensure the necessary compliances. By now, I'm sure that all the companies have taken care of this particular aspect. Now, if I see the RPT approval mechanism, that it requires approval of the board under 188. This is applicable to both private and public companies. Then wherever the uh, the uh, threshold limits are triggered under Rule 15, whatever they are prescribed. There actually it is 100 crores or 10% of the turnover. And approval of the shareholders, once the threshold limits are crossed, you have to take that also. Of course, the good part of it is that exemption is there, ordinary course of business arms length. If it is there, the entire section is not applicable to you. But at the same point, order, let me clarify that the exemption from section 188 is there, but not under section 189. 189 talks about the maintenance of register for related party transactions. So that will be there definitely. So whatever the related party transactions entries are concerned into the register is concerned, that is intact. There is no exemption as far as that is concerned. At the same point of time, let me also say the exemption is only from the applicable provisions of 188, but not under 177. So wherever the approval of the audit committee is there, applicable to all listed companies and certain class of companies which have to constitute the audit committees, even if some companies which don't need to constitute an audit committee, but they have voluntarily committed, constituted the audit committee, they're expected to ensure the compliances of 177. So regulation 23 says that it is applicable only where the companies have listed their specified security, that is equity shares or convertible securities into equity shares of high value debt listed entities. And if you see the listing regulations, listing regulations talks about two approvals only. One is the approval of audit committee and another one is the approval of the shareholders where the material related party transactions or any modifications thereof are there. That means what? Listing regulations are not talking about the board approval at all. It is That doesn't mean you don't require the board approval. But because anyway, that okay, uh, it, uh, it is covered under 188 very amply and listed companies have to comply with 188 as well as 23. So you have to ensure those compliances. In case any company fall into the any regulated sector, in addition to the two regulations like Companies Act and SEBI listing regulations, if any uh, other sectoral re regulatory requirements are there, they have to also comply with. Approval of the board, I already said that prior consent is required and uh, unless they fall in the exempted category, you cannot pass this resolution by circulation and the agenda uh, shall disclose certain details and the director who is interested in the transaction shall not be present at the board meeting. Several times this question comes whether he has to physically vacate the room. Yes, he has to physically vacate the room. And you may also ask, always ask him to 
This is what the law says. And listing regulations have not mandated the approval of the board of directors, but that doesn't mean you will bypass the board because 188 anyway it requires them. As far as the approval of the audit committee is concerned, it is the approval what it requires. So the audit committee has to either approve it or disapprove it. All transactions with related parties require approval of the audit committee and the approval is not restricted to only related party transactions under 188. That means any transaction with related party, say for example, the financial transactions or financial that were guarantee, securities, provisions, etc. They are not covered to 188. But those transactions with related parties also require audit committee approval under 177. <laughs> Though the transactions are in the ordinary course of business and arm's length, that exemption may be there under 188, but not from 177. So that's the approval is required. All companies which are required to constitute or which are voluntarily constituted, this is what I told you earlier also, is that sometimes we feel that we will not constitute an audit committee and wherever I feel like I will comply with, wherever I don't feel like I will not comply with, that is not correct. Once you constitute an audit committee, you have to comply with all the, uh, the, the requirements under 177. Only transactions up to one crore entered into by a director or officer can be ratified by the audit committee and it can give omnibus approval. And now, percent to regulation 23.2, all transactions shall require prior approval of the audit committee. This is what I said that in the earlier there was a confusion whether Whenever, see that our, my interpretation is that when you say that approval is required means what? It is always a prior approval. How can you say it is a post-factor approval? If it is the intention of the regulator or the person of the, the draftman, he would have written that post-factor approval will also be good. Why prior approval is required? But certain places, fortunately or unfortunately, when the act requires that the moment prior approval is required, then the question of interpretation comes into picture. Where it is required prior, the intention of the legislature is that prior approval is required for all others, post-factor approval is required. So it is better if the drafting is properly there in future, this kind of uh, confusion will not be there. Now the revised clauses, all related party transactions and, subse and uh, subsequent material modifications shall require prior approval of the audit committee of the listed entity. So it is uh that means the the approval of the related party transactions if they are continuous in nature that means once i approve it that may be there for say for example three four years that that the contractual uh, period is say for example for a period of five years and during this period if there is no change in the contract then you can continue with the contract without any further approvals however there is a subsequent material modification is there now, what is the modification we can understand, but what is the material modification? Is it the terms and conditions? Is it the delivery period? Is it the quality of material? Is it the pricing? Is it the discounting? What exactly is material modification? Again, I say that fortunately, the, the, the listing regulations, they are not defined what is the material modification. It is left to the companies. So it is again the same thing. The responsibility is on us. We have to ensure that to uh, audit committees have to properly define what is a material modification to a particular related party transaction. And that requires approval of the audit committee. So for this, again, audit committee has been entrusted with the responsibility and the guidelines are to be provided by the board in the related party transaction policy. Audit committee shall define the material modifications at effective 1st January 22. And uh, this is one amendment which has come not from 1st April 22 or 1st April 23, but from 1st January 22. This is the only amendment which has come from January 1st, if I am not wrong. That is the members of the audit committee who are independent directors shall approve the related party transactions. Now here, this question comes, how far it is correct, how far it is, I mean, correct in the sense means that can you ask only the, related, the independent directors to approve the related party transactions? How they equip it properly to approve the related party transactions? Do they have that kind of bandwidth with them, that kind of maturity and understanding with them to approve it? Sometimes it may happen that there may be a roadblock also, you know, because the independent directors, because of their anxiety that tomorrow if they approve, they will come under scrutiny. So better not to approve the transactions. Or alternately, get convinced by the management. So they put so many questions to the management and virtually it may lead to a kind of a frustration also. So this is not a happy situation as such. 
putting only the independent director, but no doubt about it, governance point of view, it is superb idea that independent directors have to approve the related party transactions. So here what happens is the independent directors have to be more vigilant and more diligent. They have to understand the, the, trans, the related party transactions and ensure that there is no question of any kind of undue advantage or benefit being given to the related parties, knowingly or unknowingly. This is what I normally tell the independent directors to be careful about it. So uh, this is material we have already discussed about it. Then the prior approval of the audit committee of the listed entity, a related party transaction to which subsidiary of a listed entity is a party, but the listed entity is not a related party. This is another amendment which has come. Sometimes it may so happen that the listed entity is not a, uh, the, not a party to the transaction which is being entered into with a related party, but the subsidiary of the listed entity is a party. That means if A Limited is a listed company and A Limited has, Mr. X is the related party to A Limited and A Limited is not entering into any transaction with Mr. X, but my subsidiary is entering into a transaction with Mr. X. In such case, if the, the value of that transaction exceeds 10% of the annual consolidated turnover as per the last audited financial statements of the listed entity. If it is so, then they have to go to the audit committee approval of the listed entity. That means despite the fact the listed entity is not a party to the transaction, it is the subsidiary company of the listed entity which is a party to the transaction because the transaction value exceeds that 10% of the annual consolidated turnover of the listed entity, that transaction has to go to the audit committee of the listed entity. Now, effective 1st April 23, there is a change in this that again the same thing, the scenario is the same. The listed entity is not a party to that transaction with the related party, but the subsidiary company of the listed entity is a related party and the transaction value exceeds 10% of the annual standalone turnover of the subsidiary, then that transaction has to go to the audit committee of the listed entities approval. That means there are n number of transactions which will be flowing to the audit committee of the listed entity. The reason being, when you say that 10% of the annual standalone turnover if it is a consolidated turnover, the figure would have been big, but it says that exceeds 10% of the annual standalone turnover. If I'm having a subsidiary, which is a small in nature, and say, for example, the turnover of that particular company is say five crores, and 10% of that five crores is five lakhs, and that has to go to the audit committee. I mean, this thing, and then the, the approval of the audit committee of the listed entity. So the again, the same thing, if you see, because of this particular amendment. No doubt about it. Again, governance point of view, it is good. All the transactions of the subsidiary companies are flowing to the audit committee of the listed entity. But the burden of the audit committee of the listed entity is increasing manifold. So, in fact, recently in one of the forums, I was mentioning that the audit committee has to at least have double the meetings what they were having earlier. Suppose earlier, if you are having four audit committee meetings for approval of your quarterly results. Now, at least you have to have minimum of six and two, preferably eight, if you want to ex I mean, examine these related party transactions, the way they are expected. I mean, the, the way, the way they, they have been given this kind of responsibility. At the same point of time, in fact, let me say this also that uh, most of the times if the independent directors, the comfort of the independent directors is always depending upon the company secretary. So it is the responsibility of the company secretary who are the bridge between the committees, between the board and the management. So it is the responsibility of the company secretary to flow as much information, to provide with the audit committee members with as much information as available as far as the related party transactions are concerned. So he has to sit with his colleagues and his counterparts in the finance and accounts so whatever the requirements of the audit committee are there, he should be able to communicate to them. No doubt about it, these days, uh, even the finance and accounts also, they do attend the audit committee meetings. But at the end of the day, most of the times, the board always looks towards the company secretary 
and the CFO, not to the other people. So these are the responsibility of these two people to ensure that robot information is furnished to the audit committee. So if the, the subsidiary company by any chance, if it is a listed subsidiary, then obviously the transactions need not flow up to the listed entities audit committee. It will be there at the audit committee of the listed subsidiary only. That means any transactions of the listed subsidiary, they need not flow to the audit committee of the listed entity. Similarly, the transactions of the subsidiary of the listed subsidiary also need not flow to the uh, ultimate listed entities audit committee. As far as the approval of shareholders are concerned, when RPT cross the prescribed threshold limits under the Companies Act, they have to require, again, exemption is there, no doubt. And in case of listed companies, for material related party transaction, shareholder approval is required. And in case of wholly owned subsidiary, the resolution passed by the holding company shall be sufficient. Where subsidiary accounts are consolidated with the holding company and placed before the HCM, prior approval of shareholder is not required. Yes, right to vote to the related party. Related parties are not supposed to vote on the related party transactions, but this is not applicable for private limited companies. At the same point of time, no member of the company shall vote on such a resolution if it's a related party, not applicable to private companies. Sorry. Concerned related party with the transaction shall not vote. But if 90% or more members in number or relatives of promoters or related parties, then this provision is not applicable. They can vote it. As far as the regulation 23 is concerned, the related parties cannot, can vote in negation. That means they can disapprove the transactions, but they cannot approve the transactions. Disclosure to stock exchanges, this is a new provision which has come under the new sub-regulation 23.9. Once in every six months, the listed entity shall submit to the stock exchanges disclosures of related party transactions. A format has been prescribed for that particular purpose and the FAQs have been also given by NSC and PSC on that, how the information is to be furnished and all. The listed entity shall make such disclosures every six months on the date of publication of its standalone and consolidated financial results, effective 1st April 23. In case of high value debt listed entities, also they have to comply with regulation 23 and uh, shall, they shall submit such disclosures along with its standalone financial results for the half year. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Within the given time frame, I have been told this is to be over by five o'clock. I tried my best to complete the entire presentation in about one hour and 40 minutes. And now if any questions are there, I can ready to take that. Yes, Thank sir. Thank you Once again to ICSI and to Bhavan Ji for giving me these opportunities. Now ready to face the questions. Yes, sir. So there are uh, more than 70 questions which I have received over the course of our webinar. But uh, most of the questions you have already uh, answered. I would try to cover a few questions which I think uh, either left out or uh, need your attention for uh, um, answers. So, sir, uh, can you please also uh, throw a light on the uh, disclosures under the Income Tax Act for related parties? Disclosure if, under the Income Tax Act. Yeah, if possible. See, disclosures under the Income Tax Act, I am not uh, I mean, very familiar with that, but def definitely disclosures under the accounting standards are concerned. You know, under AS18 or India S24 is concerned. That disclosures are very much required in your financial statements. You know. So the disclosures are different to that of compliances. Your transactions might have been exempted under 188. And or maybe because you don't require board approvals, you don't require shareholders approval and all. So compliances are different to that of, uh, say for example, you know, people have that uh, impression that accounting standards are applicable only to the listed companies. It is not so, even for unlisted companies also accounting standards are applicable, but they're only to the extent of that disclosures are concerned, which is to be given in the financial statements. Yes. Okay. And of course, now this, as I was mentioning under regulation 23.9, Disclosures of related party transactions are to be given to the stock exchanges once in every six months. There, of course, virtually you are uh, what's called as, you may call it as ultrasound or a CT scan or whatever it is, it is going to be there because you have to give it all the related party transactions, you have to furnish in that. Sir, uh, uh, though the second questions, though the RPT provisions are exempted 
between holding and subsidiary companies. But when the transactions is crossing the threshold limit, do we need to pass the uh, board and shareholders resolution for uh, the transactions of sale of services with its holding company? See, as I was telling you that the moment that holding company and wholly owned subsidiary company, if you are consolidating the accounts, they are exempted from the provisions of section 188. The moment you are exempted from 188 means the entire section you are exempted from. So you don't require board approval. You don't require your shareholders approval. But however, you require your audit committee approval. At the same point of time, I have also mentioned that fortunately or unfortunately, some people are uh, ignoring this fact that this exemption is also an exemption as far as the entries are to be made in the registers concerned. And recently, I think one of the companies got caught by the ROC and has been penalized for this not make the entries under register 189. So that co particular company secretary was under the impression that it is exempted under 189 also that he consulted me. I have mentioned that no, it is not exempted. You have to ensure that entries are paid in that. A uh, next question, sir. A public limited uh, did sublease of the lease premises to the related party. Will this attract uh, RPT under 188? See, leasing is definitely coming under 188, right? If a company is leasing the premises, if it is a public company or a private company, irrespective of that, if it is leasing a premises to any related party, it comes under 188 and you have to ensure the compliances. But the only thing is, again, the same thing, you have to ensure that is it for furtherance of your business? That means ordinary course of business and off-length transaction is there. If you are able to determine that, yes, it is so, based on the parameters, what I have mentioned to you, then you need you may be exempted under 188. Otherwise, you have to comply with that. Okay. okay. Sir, uh, we are talking about the threshold limits. The question is, with, let's say uh, in the month of uh, April 2023, the value uh, one RPT was entered, the value was less than 10% of the threshold limit. And uh, let's say it is proposed in the end of August or September to enter into another transaction. So uh, the question is, should the company seek approval for both the transactions or only uh, the latter one, the September one? Or uh, what happens if the transactions which is already entered, let's say in the April, uh, it has already consummated on the standalone basis, uh, which is not treated as material uh, RPT if the resolution is not passed. The, the, you are actually combining two things here. One is that yeah. you are mentioning about threshold limits. Yeah. Talk about threshold limits means it is rule 15 threshold limits you are talking about. In that case, what happens is whether you are entering into a transaction, whether it is in the month of April or in the month of March, it is a material. If whenever that particular transaction is crossing the threshold limits, you have to comply with the provisions, the shareholder approval or whatever it is. Now, the second question you are talking about is that, uh, I mean, if it is a material related party transaction, so that is a, for the listed company. So in case of listed company, that no doubt about it, you have to comply with Companies Act as well as with your uh, listing regulations also. So there, suppose say, for example, in the if the transaction, what you are doing, entering into, in the beginning itself, it is not only crossing the threshold limits, but is also a material related party transaction. In such case, you have to quote both the sections of uh, the, the, the provisions of Companies Act as well as of the listing regulations, and you will take only one shareholder approval, number one. Number two, suppose say, for example, you have taken today, but you are further extending the contract. That means you are modifying the contract. And when you are modifying the contract, that contract is triggering the material related party transaction limit if it is a listed company. Whether I need to take a shareholder approval again, answer is yes, because you are modifying the contract number one and it is also falling in the definition of material related party transaction. So it requires shareholders approval under a different uh, what's called a premise. And then the information what you will be furnishing, the, the what was the earlier contract, what is the modification and how it is going to be there. Sub query to this question, sir. If let's say uh, in the first instance it is not crossing the ten percent uh, limit, and the moment I am entering into another transaction, and thereby the threshold limit is increasing beyond ten percent, so uh, what to do about uh, first transaction? See, first transaction you will continue. 
First transaction you will continue but with, with whatever the approvals you require, whether it is audit committee approval or board approval or whatever it is, because it has not touched the threshold limit, you will not go to the shareholders approval. But when you are further extending that particular contract and when you are hitting the threshold limits, before you execute that contract, you have to have the shareholders approval with you. Okay. Same is the case with material related party transaction also. Till that time, you are not triggering that definition. You can continue within the normal course with your audit committee approval and board approval only. But the moment when you are triggering that definition of material related party transaction, the 1000 crores limit, that point of time, you have to have your approval of shareholders with your, in your hand. And then only you can enter into that particular contract. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, how to apply the exception uh, laid down in section 2, subsection 76, 8 for the private companies, specifically for foreign subsidiaries? Okay, come back again. 276, clause 8. Yeah. So, how to apply the exception laid down under section 2, subsection 76, clause 8 for private companies, specifically for foreign subsidiaries? I'm sorry. In fact, I need to recap that I'm not. No, sure. The no, lawyer sure. has answered this question that if they contact me offline, I may be able to answer. But I'm, I must admit my ignorance as far as this is concerned at this point of time. No, sure. No, sure. So the, does list of related parties of unlisted subsidiary to be prepared as per the Companies Act definition or LODR definition of related party? See that every company has to prepare the list of related parties as it is applicable to it. So, and similarly, at the, let me also say that as far as the compliances are concerned, also the same thing that I have to, uh, what's called as ensure the compliances as a subsidiary, whatever is required under the Companies Act, because listing regulations are not applicable. But, at the, point, but at the same point of time, my holding company is under obligation under the listing regulations for certain compliances for which I have to cooperate with them. Say, for example, if I am entering into a transaction of related party with the listed entities, related party, okay? So I have to now say whether I have to comply with my uh, related party, this thing, not required because it is not a related party to me as far as 276 is concerned. It is a related party to me as far as the listing regulations are concerned. So for the to enable my holding company, to comply with the listing provisions, I have to seek the approval of the audit committee of the listed entity. Okay. So it means it means for uh, the limited purpose, I need to uh, prepare the list uh, as if it is a uh, listed company because any ways I have to support the listed company which is a holding company. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, is definition uh, deputation of employees to an associate company covered under RPTs? Uh, come back, come back again. Deputation of employee to an yeah, yeah. company. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is a, you see, because you are availing services, you know, whether you are deputing or you are getting deputed, it is definitely availing or rendering of service. You must be definitely exchanging the debit notes or credit notes, whatever it is. And that is a related party transaction. And especially it is common as far as the shared services are concerned in the group companies. This do take place, whether it is the space, whether it is IT, security, admin services, IT service, all these things are now. So these are all shared services. Definitely they fall and they trigger the regulated, I mean, real party transactions. But as a, they, these were in the recurring nature and uh, in the routine course of business, you may take omnibus approval of the audit committee is concerned. Because they will certainly be exempted as far as 188 is concerned, because they are in the ordinary course of business and you have to ensure that they are at arm's length basis. If you are able to do that, 188 is exempted. As far as 177 is concerned, you can take it as an omnibus basis. Okay, okay sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, as regards the RPT for 10% turnover, how to consider transactions with related party for general meeting resolutions, whether uh, it should be per party, per transaction, per type of transaction with many related party or per uh, party, multiple uh, types of transactions. So what is your uh, uh, answer on this? See that uh, if you want uh, this thing, I always say that refer to the revised guidance note, you will have good answer for that. But as far as I'm concerned, when you talk about material related party transactions, it is with a related party. 
if I am a listed entity, I am entering into a transaction with a related party. Whether that transaction is a material related party transaction or not, I have to see my dealings with that particular party as far as my subsidiary company dealings with that particular party is concerned. I have to uh, accumulate whole things. Then I have to arrive at the material related party transaction. So now the question uh, comes. Now the question comes. I am answering that question also. What you are asking? <laughs> that is the industry is grappling with, and the clarity is not there. Whether I need to put the transactions into different buckets or I have to combine the whole thing. Okay. Right. That suppose, say for example, from the same related party, I am buying materials. I am selling materials. I am rendering services. I am availing. I am providing services. If these kind of transactions are there. Now the apples and mangoes, oranges, are you going to combine everything or not? The clarity is not there. So industry is following its own practices. And as of now, let us continue with the same practice. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. The class, that much clarity is not there. You know? Yes, I, I do agree, sir. I do agree. That's why I was uh, uh, smiling when asking the question because uh, it is a disputed uh, question in sir. Uh, there is no clear cut answer to this question. Yes. Yeah. Sir, and, the look... second thing is, and second thing is, let me also say, Pawan, that this is nothing new. This was there right from 2015 onwards. The same, uh, so the, the, the whatever the practices industry is following it, it is following it. So uh, restrictive uh, meaning be uh, uh, interpreted and followed. I can say that. <laughs> yes. Sir, LODR requires approval of related party transactions by subsidiary of listed company, by audit committee, shareholders of listed company, if it exists, uh, exceeds the threshold prescribed. Can LLP be technically called a subsidiary? See, that LLP under the Companies Act, it is a subsidiary. Right? Under the listing regulations, it is silent about it. But it is, uh, I mean, advisable, according to me, you might take it as a this thing, but again, the same thing, right? as I told you that LLP is either a subsidiary company for a limited purpose or for the purpose of related party transactions as a governance point of view, given me a chance, I will take that thing into, uh, I mean, into that in the, in the whole bunch, you know, together with uh, subsidiaries, JVs, associates and all because it is a governance point of view, it covers you know, okay, by you are dealing with a related party transaction and your own LLP is there. Then you are extending that provision to your subsidiary companies, JV companies, associates. Why not to LLP? The decision related party transaction, yes, you, by all means, you take it. Enough. Because provided you are a partner in that LLP, the listed entity is a partner in that LLP. Okay. Correct. 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 Not the listed company directors are partners and all. No. Sir, uh, that. Uh... Criteria of uh, uh, controlling the decision making and that be uh, in, inferred over here. Uh, see, that is only to the extent of whether the LLP is related party to you or not. Yes, for that particular purpose, you can say that by controlling uh, purpose that it is there, but that LLP is my related party. To okay. that extent, you can say no doubt about it. Yes. Okay. Sir, uh, for this, this question, next question is for NBFC company, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of a public unlisted company, uh, which gives the loan to its holding company. Okay. So approval under 188, uh, apart from 188, 186, by both the companies would be required or only one company? See, 188, anyway, that financial transactions are not covered under 188. Okay. So 188 approval is not required. So you don't need to fall into that exemption now also because 188, if you see that loan loan borrowings, providing guarantee security, it is not covered. Right. But certainly that audit committee approval is very much required for that. Even if you are complying with 186 or you are exempted from that, that is a different thing. But certainly if you are giving a loan, even if NBFC company is giving a loan to a related party and NBFC companies have to comply with companies act also. So 177 approval is very much required. Okay. Thank you. Next question is, sir, uh, the CS and CFO salaries considered under RPT, I am triggering the limits of RPT, uh, which needs to be taken care. Yes, CS and because companies, the KMP is a related party, right? So at the first time when you are recruiting the KMP, he is not a related party. That means when you are taking for the first time, when you are appointing a managing director, executive director, CEO, CS, CFO, 
at that point of time they are not related parties but subsequently once they are appointed they become related parties and any kind of the, the after that what the once they become the related parties that uh, whatever you are entering into the transaction with them that comes under differently a related party transaction so what normally we do is by that even kmp salary perks and everything also the increments etc we do run through the omnibus approval okay sir sir recently a uh, secretary auditor was penalized for not identifying the related party transactions that disclosures because uh, the responsibility in many many ways we always think that the, it is the uh, responsibility of the auditors to identify the related party transaction and report it and might be uh, in that uh, judgment the secretary auditor was penalized for not identifying the uh, I think if i am not if i am not wrong even the statutory auditor also has been penalized yes sir both of them have been yes. penalized yeah, apart yeah. from the company of course yes sir <laughs> Yes, sir. So, uh, do you think it is the responsibility of the secretarial auditor to identify the uh, related party transaction? This is general uh, discussions. See, Not definitely, definitely it is because you are the person who is uh, giving a this thing that the company has complied with all the these things and all that. Okay. Only thing is. no doubt about it whether you will be able to do hundred percent or not at all. Because if I am not wrong, in that company. that audit that related party was doing transactions with the company for about 4 years not it is one year hmm. it is for four five years it was happening and the, neither the statutory auditors have any clue nor the secretarial auditors have any clue and it is substantial transactions right how it has come to uh, the above the surface is by a whistle blower correct that is that is the point if i am not wrong the regulator got cheesed off is that a whistle blower came to know and not the auditors okay yeah yes okay sir yeah. so uh, now what happens is one, now what happens that's why i always caution that people whether you are in practice or you are in service it is a material okay most of the times earlier it used to have a concept sir i am in practice mujhe kya lena dena hai i am in service mujhe kya lena dena hai now the thing is that you cannot say that i am not concerned with the law you are concerned with the law today you may be having a client which is not a listed company it is an unlisted company you are having 10 clients today what do you say is sir nothing to do with the listed regulations but tomorrow the 11th company who has become client to you it is a listed company can you sit and understand the listing regulations at that point of time you have to prepare yourself correct so that's why i said that apart from the complexity of life complexity of professional life as well as the complexity of the regulations are increasing day by day and that's why i always appreciate institute of company secretaries the amount of efforts what it takes to give the guidance to give the this organizing these kind of programs whether it is through regional councils chapters and all it is a commendable thing what we are doing it and similarly ssb you know that power very well yes, yes sir how much is the money time energy resources uh, it should be spending apart from the members who are members of the board that's why my i always take the opportunity which are the forum it is available to me that to submit all the participants kindly go through the secretarial standards the guidance notes issued by icsi and really you know especially the independent directors related party transactions pit regulations corporate social responsibility the guidance notes are above par if not superior to any other uh, guidance notes but they are not inferior also you know correct well, my problem always comes is instead of referring to the guidance note people put the questions in the whatsapps they depend more on the whatsapp because they want instant result in instant uh, answers instant answers will always put you in trouble so kindly take efforts do give a read to the guidance notes sir. i do agree with you sir and icsi is really uh, fortunate to have people like you who are always pitching in whenever uh, we require your help and many a times it is one one got frozen
I think Pawan, uh, I think from my side, problem is there, technical team. Acha, Pawan side, Pawan side. Okay, okay. Fine, thank you. Yeah, I think he's back. Paul, you're on mute. Sir, apologies. Uh, I think there is some uh, issues with my uh, internet. So yeah, I yeah. logged in to my mobile. So the question was, sir, uh, whether uh, uh, unsecured loan taken from trust, where the uh, director of a company is also a trustee in that private trust, will form a part of RPT. See, again, if you see the, in fact, okay, multiple times of this question has come whether the trust is a related party or not. If you see section 26, two subsections, I mean, that 276, trust is not a related party. And so that's why, as far as the trust is concerned, I don't need to, uh, I mean, okay, uh, what's called as comply with the provisions of RPT is concerned. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Sir, two companies, next question, sir. Two companies, shareholders and directors are same and uh, both the companies are entering into trademark agreement. Will it attract RPT? The trademark agreement in what way? You cannot simply say trademark agreement. Okay. So let's say uh, assignment of trademark agreement. So assignment of trademark agreement, it may fall in the definition of service. Right. So if it is uh, one company assigning to the other company, so I may take it as you are rendering a kind of a service for which you are uh, charging it. So I may take it as an RPT under 188. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Sir, uh, next question I am uh, I have received is director remuneration we have dealt with is considered as a related party. The next question is, Whether the listed companies are required to take the disclosure under Regulation 30 of SEBI LODR, if the uh, RPT transactions uh, value of uh, transaction, which is uh, less than 10% of the net worth or total income of the previous year, audited financials of the company. See, Regulation 30 disclosure to the stock exchanges and Regulation 23 are entirely different. Okay. Correct. Regulation 30 is what? Suppose, say, for example, you are entering into a what's called a you have a big uh, contract you have received. You have been awarded by a big uh, build operating contract kind of thing. No doubt about it, that related party compliance under Regulation 23, you will do it. But the moment you are entering into, I mean, awarded with that contract, that is a uh, what's called material information which will have an impact on your share price. So that you have to share with under regulation 30. So these are two different compliances that have nothing to do with the 10% or 5% limits are concerned. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. sir. Sir, what happens if board of directors of unlisted uh, subsidiary of a uh, listed company enters into RPT in violation of regulation 23? Sir, come back again. What happens if POD of unlisted subsidiary of a uh, listed company enters into RPT in violation of regulation 23. 
it means uh, whether the board of unlisted subsidiary would be bound uh, by LODR. See, I told you that uh, the subsidiary company has its own compliances up there. Okay. It has nothing to do with SEBI. So SEBI regulation 23 is concerned. You don't need to comply with regulation 23. Because suppose, say, for example, the audit committee members, independent directors have to approve that and all, that is not applicable to the subsidiary companies. Subsidiary companies have to comply with whatever the rules and regulations have to be applicable to it. That is Companies Act only. To what extent subsidiary companies of a listed entity have to come in to comply with the regulation 23 is concerned? It says that any transaction which is subsidiary companies entering into with a related party of that listed entity it has to obtain the approval of the list audit committee of the listed entity. So that is what is concerned. Now, suppose say for example, that audit committee of the listed entity, you are not put up the proposal. You are not obtained the listed audit committee of the listed entity's approval. Whether SEBI will punish this as a subsidiary company, answer is no. Because SEBI has no jurisdiction on that. Okay, okay. So now the, uh, now the question comes that, that I think you have to exit from one uh, out of the other. Ah, yeah, good. So what will happen is that the listed entity will be penalized by SEBI because it is the responsibility of the listed entity to also ensure compliances as far as its subsidiaries are concerned. So if the subsidiary company is entering into a transaction with a related party of the listed entity, even if the listed entity is not a party to that particular agreement. But if it requires audit committee approval of the listed entity, if it has not been obtained, the listed company will be held responsible, not the subsidiary company. You are on mute, uh, Paul. Sub question is also asked for this, whether uh, under regulation 23 only, uh, will a company be required to aggregate all transaction of listed entity and its subsidiary? for uh, ascertaining the materiality threshold? See, it is not the responsibility of the subsidiary to ensure the threshold of materiality and all. That is, I mean, that materiality part transaction or not, that is the responsibility of the listed entity. As I told you that when you are arriving at the material related party transaction with a particular related party, the listed entity has to combine its own transactions with that related party and the transactions of all the subsidiary companies also and has to arrive at the material related party transaction. Yes. Then it has to ensure the approvals, whatever are required. So it is not the responsibility of the subsidiary company to work out the material related party transaction. It is the responsibility of the listed entity only. Okay. So only thing is that, as I was mentioning to you, the transactions of subsidiary companies with the related party of the listed entity also require compliances. It is the responsibility of the listed entity to ensure that proper awareness is created across the group companies. Because most of the times it may so happen the subsidiary companies might not be aware of the provisions of the listing regulations. So it is the responsibility of the listed company to ensure that proper awareness is created across the group companies. Okay. And that's why I always advocate that, uh, I mean, wherever I go and give that corporate training, I always say that you have to, that's why I say that regulation 23, you cannot implement in isolation. You require handholding of all your subsidiaries, JVs, uh, associates, etc., etc. Okay. Yes, sir. One, uh, uh, I'll ask one last question because uh, time is up. I have uh, received, as I said, more than 80 questions. So uh, I'll take this as a last question. So can a uh, foreign holding or associate company will also be termed as a related party uh, for section 188? Yes. Okay. So all even, that... even this question comes that uh, when you are talking about the compliances in regulation 23, a question is there that suppose if my subsidiary is a foreign company, and it has also to give its related parties, list of related parties to the holding company, which is a listed entity. Now the question comes whether the foreign subsidiary has to arrive at the listed uh, the related parties as per the Indian Companies Act or listing regulations or as per the local laws. Okay, how it has to determine the related parties? The clarity is not there. 
So, because that foreign company may not be able to determine the related parties such an exhaustive list what we have here. So, maybe to some extent we can say on, the, uh, on a matter of fairness that if the local loss is having some kind of a related party definition, they may depend upon that because that is what it has to comply with. If my subsidiary company is there, my subsidiary company will arrive at the list of related parties as per the loss applicable to it. But ye mera related parties hai, ye le lo. You know, so yes. that clarity is not there. But as of now, this is one view which is emerging. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So thanks a lot. Uh, I must say, uh, hold, uh, hosting you today was a uh, pleasure for me. Basically, it made my day academically also. And I thank for thank a lot uh, for your complete three sixty degree uh, overview. And also the details on the uh, technical subject like RPT. And uh, your session was complete in all respects, sir, be it uh, 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 details of, let's say, uh, uh, ordinary course of business, arms length, SEBI LODR provisions, the regulations, the interchangeability of various uh, regulations apl applicable, the foreign uh, transactions, the sharing of transactions, CEO, CFOs. You, sir, not only discuss the law, but also give a practical example so that uh, we understand the subject completely. And I'm sure your session uh, is very well uh, received by all the attendees today. Uh, we at ICSI are really thankful to you for accepting our invitation and uh, sharing your uh, knowledge passionately, which is your uh, hobby, sharing the uh, knowledge passionately. Uh, sir, at uh, ICSI, we would love to host you again and again for various uh, topics. And we are really uh, grateful and indebted to you for your time and uh, sharing of your knowledge, sir. We thank thanks you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Pawan, for your kind words. And at the same point of time, I reiterate my sincere gratitude and uh, appreciation to ICSI for having me here. And at the same point of time, several times I say that for me also, it is a learning process. And uh, today, for the first time after a long time, I got fumbled on one question which I could not answer. Okay. So, <laughs> Certainly, I will come prepared uh, properly next time. My apologies for that particular question, which I could not answer. In fact, it's bad on my part, which I should not uh, have. Sir, it, is a, it is a sign of greatness that you are uh, still uh, saying, I will come prepared next time. Because I know, even though we ask you to speak on RPT kind of uh, things, you will uh, just uh, stand up and deliver a session for <laughs> not, not less than three hours. So, and still you are saying, I will come prepared. So that is your greatness, sir. Thanks a but, lot. But at the same point in time, let me power request you that please send me that question. I know I need to examine that. I couldn't register that. So I request any of your colleagues to please yes. send me that question on a WhatsApp, number one. Yes, and sir. number two, at the same point of time to the participants, let me say that uh, the time of uh, the two hours is very, very less if yeah. I have to cover the entire Companies Act and the listing regulations. But at the same point of time, to the best of my ability, I could uh, give justice to the topic given to me. And if anyone has any kind of issues, they can always uh, contact me on my, uh, I mean, offline, I will be able to uh, what's called as an okay, answer the questions to the extent of my ability. Thank you very much. Once again, God bless you all. Thank you, sir. More than 20,000 uh, uh, attendees were attending and listening to you patiently, sir. My, my privilege. <laughs> my, I'm privileged. I'm privileged. Again, thanks to ICSI for giving me this kind of privilege, Bhavan. Thank you, sir. And at the same point of time, my appreciation to you also as a good moderator and you were also there for the last two and a half hours. I know what kind of pressure you have on your time is concerned and I must appreciate that. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye.